Cup evening quality. news and campaign report, first on BBC One with Michael Burke. Tony Blair says, trust me, as he launches the Labour manifesto. Nothing new, but he says nothing he cannot deliver. Terrorists have paralysed the heart of Britain's motorway network. And the world's biggest fraudster, the man convicted of filching three quarters of a billion pounds. Good evening. Labour launched its election manifesto today, a ten-point so-called contract with the people that gathered together policies and commitments the party's already made. It promised no increase in headline income taxes, to use a windfall tax to take a quarter of a million young people off the dole, to cut class sizes and hospital waiting lists, and to devolve power to Scotland and Wales. Tony Blair said he wasn't promising the earth, but what he could deliver. The Tories called it a contract, not a contract. The Liberal Democrats said it was just warm words and woolly phrases. Our political editor Robin Oakley reports. New Labour's never been short of style. Launch day for the manifesto they hope will win them their first election since 1974 saw some painstaking positioning, both on policy and personnel. Is this just to get level pegging? It's all about trust. If they can convince the electorate they are new Labour, not old Labour in disguise, Mr Blair believes, then they'll win. And everything was being done to smooth out any wrinkles along the way. The music and razzmatazz we've heard before, but as the crucial document was held aloft, it was without the famous smile. Mr Blair had no doubt what was at stake. This is the historic opportunity for the Labour Party, this election, to become a modern party of progress and justice. To become that broad-based party, not attached to narrow or sectional or class interests, that represents all the best of the values of the centre and centre-left. This is our historic opportunity. If we blow this opportunity, we blow our place in history. Arguing that a party which had changed itself had demonstrated its fitness for changing Britain, Labour's leader, who admitted that not everything the Tories had done was wrong, offered a personal ten-point contract with the people, not promising the earth, but a fresh start and measurable progress before the next election. Our manifesto does not promise the earth. It does not say it can do everything. There are no magic wands or instant solutions. What we do say is that Britain can be better, that Britain deserves better. Along with grander aims like a Scottish Parliament and reforming the Lords, the manifesto focused on achievable practicalities like reducing hospital waiting lists. But the top priority was education with the promise of reductions in class sizes and zero tolerance of underperforming schools. I don't want second best for my kids, and I don't want second best for yours. And the way to get that is to raise the standards in all our schools. Attempting to bury Labour's old tax and spend image, there was the pledge not to increase the standard or top rate of income tax for five years. But what about another aspiration? You talk of the 10p starting rate of tax as being a long-term objective. Well, in the long term, we're all dead. How long term is your long term? I am not going to make a guarantee on when we can do it because I am not going to make any commitment that I cannot be absolutely sure of delivery. That is Interviewed later, Mr Blair was asked why Labour needed its promised early budget. Would it just be for the promised windfall tax on privatised utilities designed to raise the funds to get 250,000 youngsters off the dole? It is for the welfare to work strategy uh, and that has to be done straight away so that we can start getting some of these young people, the long term unemployed, off benefit and into work. Tories are homing in on the promises of a minimum wage and legislation on union recognition. Mr Major, campaigning in the Scottish borders, insisted that new Labour remained a danger. It is not a game of cricket running the country. You don't have one side fat and then the other. If a side doing well and improving the quality of life in this country, let us go on and continue to improve it. Don't let someone turn back all the improvements that we have made over recent years. 
The Liberal Democrats leader, Paddy Ashdown, campaigning in the West Country, will launch his party's manifesto tomorrow. He said Labour offered little of substance. Looking at this manifesto, it makes two impossible promises. The one is to improve education and health, and the other is not to put any more money into it. And now those can't be met, and Mr Blair is going to have to decide which of those two he intends to break. At a West London shopping centre, Labour's leader drew the kind of crowds and autograph hunters who might have greeted the first Spice Boy. But the key to what they'll do in the polling booths, he knows, is whether they'll buy that ten-point contract he's offering. A critical day has gone well for Labour. There may not be any surprises in their manifesto, but that, they say, is evidence their plans are long thought out and costed. Reassurance is now the name of their game. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster. Tony Blair said he would tackle division and inequality in society and provide what he called life chances for all. This is the detail of Labour's promises. At the core of the manifesto are policies on social welfare and education. The party says it will increase spending on education if, as the party hopes, unemployment falls, but doesn't put a figure on it. There's a commitment to cut class sizes to 30 or under for five, six and seven-year-olds. And there's a guarantee of nursery education for all four-year-olds. The government's nursery voucher scheme would be scrapped. On the health service, Labour says it will match the government's promise to increase spending in real terms year on year and remove 100,000 patients from hospital waiting lists. The manifesto promises a royal commission to look at the long-term funding of care for the elderly and a review on pensions. On crime, Labour says it will speed up the punishment of persistent young offenders and it promises a new Commons vote for a ban on all handguns. The manifesto repeats Labour's commitment to constitutional change with referendums for a Scottish Parliament and a Welsh Assembly and an end to the presence of hereditary peers in the House of Lords. Tony Blair said his party's commitments on social policy would build a modern welfare state and strengthen family life. Here's our social affairs editor, Neil Dixon. Labour's post-war Prime Minister Clement Attlee presided over one of the most radical administrations of this century. The state not only took over great industries like coal and rail, it also undertook to provide health, education and social security for all. His aim was to create a more equal society. Today, the man who now leads Labour presented a rather different vision for a different age. New Labour's big idea is not equality, but opportunity, specifically taking youngsters like these off benefit and putting them into work. As a young man, Clement Attlee was a community worker here. Ninety years on, the problems of youth unemployment and alienation remain. As far as I'm concerned, the politician has, they haven't given me nothing, not a job, uh, nothing like that. So I can't exactly say they're, they're really offering me anything. I think it is very difficult because not only are you Asian, because that, that makes it hard, you know, right from the start. And the fact that, you know, you haven't got no, well, I've got some qualifications, but, you know, they, they tend to say that they're not good enough. But Labour says it'll use its windfall tax on the utilities to fund a huge new training programme. It's the party's big spending pledge. Young people will have to take a job or training. Staying on benefit will not be an option. It's certainly a good idea to get people off Social Security and back into work. But I think there's a question over whether in the end it can pay for itself, particularly as unemployment falls. The people who are left unemployed take a lot of effort, a lot of work to help them back into work. It's very likely to end up at best breaking even and quite possibly costing money. Targeting young delinquents is another Labour priority, although it's sometimes hard to distinguish their plans with those of the Conservatives. Both parties propose to make parents more responsible for their children. Both say they'll cut the long delays between arrest and sentencing. For those working with young people, that at least would be an overdue reform. It's an excellent principle, however, I think the practicalities are another matter because it's not, just, it's not only a matter for the police service, it's for the whole of the criminal justice system. In schools too, Labour is not proposing wholesale change or vast extra spending but it is promising smaller primary classes paid for by scrapping the assisted places scheme which allows children from poorer homes to attend private schools. And running a more efficient operation is also the theme for the NHS. Here too, no extra public money is promised other than through cutting bureaucracy and by matching the Conservative pledge to spend more in real terms each year. For Clement Attlee, public spending was the key to a better society. For New Labour, the state is still important, 
but its role is limited. Like the Conservatives, the emphasis is on giving people a hand up rather than a hand out. Neil Dixon, BBC News, Tower Hamlets. Labour attacked the government's record on the economy, saying it had created a period of boom-bust economic instability. The manifesto highlights the need to invest in industry and in a skilled workforce, but only within the government's existing public spending targets for the next two years. On taxation, Tony Blair promised a new trust on tax with the electorate. Labour says it won't raise the basic or top rates of tax throughout the next parliament. It'll aim to introduce a starting rate of tax of 10 pence in the pound, but says this is a long-term objective, not a promise. And there is a promise to cut VAT on fuel to 5%. On jobs, Labour stresses its commitment to getting people from welfare to work. It promises work or training for 250,000 young people to be financed by a planned windfall tax on privatised utilities. And a minimum wage to be set at what the party says will be a sensible rate, though it doesn't say what. Employers must recognise trade unions where a majority of people in a workplace vote to be represented. And the party reaffirmed its support for the European Social Chapter, saying it wouldn't cost jobs. Well, joining me now is Peter Jay, our economics editor. Peter, can Labour afford what it's promising? Well, some things, like the VAT, cut in VAT on fuel, will cost not more than half a billion, which in this context is peanuts. Starting the income tax at 10% can cost anything from a skyscraping 10 billion down to less than nothing, depending on how you define it. But the main thing is that a Labour government later this year, just like a Tory government if they're elected, is going to have to increase taxes because the government deficit, the government borrowing, is far too high for an economy in the present condition of the British economy. By promising that they won't increase income tax rates and won't extend VAT to food and children's clothes and things like that, Labour have forced themselves to rely on the other shots in the Chancellor's locker, but there are plenty of those, like squeezing allowances on income tax, like abolishing mortgage interest rate relief, like putting up VAT, like increasing taxes on companies. It's really not very difficult once the election's out of the way for either party. So what are you saying, that Labour's economic policies don't actually add up? It all depends on growth, and Labour's hopes of getting past a long-term growth within five years are probably about as romantic as the Tories' claims that they have already done so. And without that faster growth, then almost inevitably Labour would either have to increase the tax burden over the next five years, even more than Kenneth Clark already plans in his figures to do, or they'd have to disappoint the people who think that a Labour government will mean extra money for health, education, and things like that. And then they risk finding out that they have succeeded in persuading the city and business that they've nothing to fear from Labour, only at the price of persuading everybody else they ha that they haven't much to hope. Looking at the economic policies and the two manifestos that have been published so far, you're struck uh, more by the similarities than the differences. Is it going to matter, economically speaking, which of the two parties you vote for? Not much if you assume that both parties will govern precisely according to the script in their manifestos. But of course, in real life, it is the pressure of government over five years and the pressure of events over five years which brings out the deepest instincts and the real priorities both of parties uh, and people and that's the way that we're going to discover and to the extent that you believe that the parties will break the promises in their manifestos and break them in opposite directions then you might find that it was really quite important how you voted. Peter Jay, thanks very much indeed. Well that's the news from the campaign trail for the moment. There'll be more later in the programme. But now the rest of the day's news has been judging the mood in one of the key election battlegrounds. But first over to Anne Perkins at our Westminster campaign desk for her nightly election roundup. Evening, Michael. With his manifesto out of the way, John Major, his wife Norma, and the rest of the team were back on their battle bus. Our correspondent John Sopel, who's travelling with the Prime Minister, was given exclusive access as the campaign headed for the Scottish border this morning with early confusing reports of the IRA motorway attack coming through. On board the battle bus, once more into the fray. With two weeks having been lost to sleaze, there's now an added sense of urgency among his team that time is short to turn round the Tories' massive poll deficit. But John Major is still Prime Minister and has to be briefed on all matters of national importance. Today, of course, the chaos brought to Birmingham. Can't yet they use code words. Um, and it's um, usual fear and disruption. But no bombs. No bombs. Hopes. Yeah. But we'll probably get more of that. 
but this mobile command centre is here primarily for scoring party political points, as John Major is briefed by his press secretary, Sheila Gunn, for his visit to Scotland. Just before they got to Gretna Green, I spoke to the Prime Minister and his wife. There are 30 million British electors out there. I suspect they're as sick of hearing all this nonsense about sleaze as you are and as I am. I rather fancy they'd like to hear about the issues that affect themselves and their families. I think Jim Callaghan said that towards the end of his time in office in Downing Street, that you pull the levers and they don't work. The levers I've been pulling have got unemployment down, they've got inflation down, they've got people's living standards rising, they've got more of our children getting a better education, and they've got more people treated in the health service. Now, those are the levers I've been pulling over the last five years, and I'm going to go on pulling them over the next five years as well. But after the battering that John Major's taken, I asked his wife, didn't she just want him to give up? No, I think it is worth it, and we've seen what he's achieved. It is worth it. Never a flicker? No. <laughs> there is no talk of defeat in John Major's immediate circle, but as the Prime Minister checks himself for another round of campaigning, there's no disguising either just what an uphill struggle he has. John Sopel, BBC News, with John Major's campaign. The much-publicised Tory chicken stunt, designed to embarrass the Labour leader after he pulled out of the negotiations for a live TV debate, ran out of battery power tonight, overwhelmed by puns. Mr Chicken, um, a few words, please. The hen was meant to follow Mr Blair and taunt him for chickening out of the debates. Aren't you just uh, making Conservative policies go cheap? First he got hempecked by a headless chicken in central London. Peck him, Dave, peck him! He flew to Stirling, intending to embarrass Tony Blair's Scottish tour with a new anti-devolution slogan. But in the crowds awaiting the Labour leader, he brushed up against a fox. And there was even worse to come. He lost his head to a trophy hunter. What a perfectly foul day. Two opinion polls published in tomorrow's newspapers suggest that Labour's support may be slipping slightly, though they're still well ahead of the Conservatives in both. A Gallup poll for the Daily Telegraph puts Labour on 52%, down 2.5% from a similar survey published 10 days ago, but within the margin of error of 3%. The Conservatives are on 31%, up 2. That's a Labour lead of 21 points, down 4.5% and the Liberal Democrats are on 11%, up 0.5. A Harris poll for The Independent also puts Labour at 52%, down 2 from their previous poll last week, but again within the margin of error. The Tories are on 28%, down 2 as well, and the Liberal Democrats on 14%, up 3. Both polls were conducted last week, before the launch of the Conservative and Labour manifestos. The findings are largely in line with other recent polls. Politicians, of course, always say that after the last election, they don't believe the polls, and at the moment, the bookies tend to agree. Maybe because punters seem reluctant to part with their money when the turf accountants treat the election outcome as a certainty. As they come to the first. The year's greatest betting spree, the Grand National Meeting at Aintree, kicked off this afternoon. Flimsy Truth was an early casualty. The Lords of Faller, Flimsy Truth has gone back in the field. But it's not lack of faith in politicians that's stopping the punters speculating on the great political race. The odds on a Labour victory are simply too short. Take seven to one, there's no tax here. On a one pound stake, you'd win just four pence. From the purely point of view of having uh, to back Labour to win it, it's seven to one on, which is rather prohibitive odds. I think if people are going to have a bet, I think the best value is to bet on the number of seats that individual parties are going to get. And one way to do that is spread betting. More choice, they say, more chance. We make a prediction on how many seats we believe each party will attain at the general election. Our prediction for Labour at the moment, as you can see, is 367 to 373. All you have to decide is whether you think that Labour will do better than our prediction or worse than our prediction. But hang on, the polls suggest Labour will win well over 400 seats. These people claim they're better at getting the results right. When you're speaking to a pollster, I don't know you personally, you feel not particularly inclined to tell the truth unless you want to. When you're putting your money down, you, in effect, tell the truth very clearly. You only put it down when you're convinced you're right. Something to cheer Tories with small majorities. At the final fence now, it's quiet still. Oh, he goes to the corner, but he gets away with it. And that's it from us for tonight. Back to you, Michael, in the studio.
Throughout the campaign, we'll be reporting on the campaign issues, not only in the places the party leaders visit on their battle buses, but up and down the country where thousands of ordinary candidates are fighting to win their own contests. The East Midlands is one of the most crucial battlegrounds because what happens there could determine who forms the next government. The Conservatives hold 28 seats, Labour have 15 and the Liberal Democrats haven't any seats at all. The region includes eight Tory-held marginals, most of them west of Nottingham, which Labour must win to gain an overall majority. It's these marginals which make the East Midlands more significant in this election than the West Midlands, traditionally regarded as the region where general elections are won or lost. Peter Sissons is in Nottingham, in the heart of the East Midlands. Michael, under Britain's first-past-the-post system, it's not how many votes stack up. A general election like this could turn on as few as 150,000 votes spread across 40 or 50 seats. And it's here in Middle England, which is far from being some fictional place, that many of those crucial votes will be cast. So what is exercising the minds of the people who cast them? Our political correspondent, Carol Walker, on what matters in the East Midland marginals. The car seats have replaced the coalface for most of the workforce at this factory in Mansfield. The pit closure programme was a devastating experience for men like these, for their families and for the local economy. The former miners have adapted to new ways of working in the new businesses like this one making car seat covers, which are part of the revival of the East Midlands. But they still worry about the security of their jobs. When I started at pit, I got a job for life, allegedly. But as it turns out, I just got 11 years. But now for me, job security is a big, big thing. It's taxes and prices of everything going up, inflation. You know, you've got to have a job now to live. I mean, we were told one thing, the next day they were shutting the pits. We didn't know where we stood. I opted to take redundancy because I was young enough at the time to get out and hopefully get a new job. But there are no, there are no jobs that are paying that money anymore. The car seat covers are loaded for distribution. The changes in people's working lives here have accompanied some dramatic political swings to the Tories under Margaret Thatcher in the turbulent 1980s and only a partial return to Labour at the last election. Now the area contains a high proportion of the key marginals which Labour must capture if it's to win the election. Well, over there, that used to be um, that used to be a coal mine, like a you know a workshop or something. The East Midlands lacks a strong regional identity, stretching from the Derbyshire peaks to the affluent countryside of Northamptonshire, with clusters of urban seats in Nottingham, Leicester, and Derby. The economy has undoubtedly been boosted by inward investment. The car seat covers made by the former miners are destined for the huge Toyota factory near Derby. The company's president provoked much controversy when he warned Britain might lose Japanese investment if it decided not to join a single European currency. It's invested a billion pounds here, created more than two and a half thousand jobs and helped many small spin-off businesses. Now, with the election looming, it says economic stability is the priority. Any business likes to be able to manage the risk, and so we need to have a good idea of what is coming in the future so that we can plan and manage it. And that's irrespective of who wins the election. You know, we have to operate within the laws of the land, and we're quite happy to do that. But we don't, we don't like so much volatility. We, you know, we like to long-term plan, and it's much easier to do that in a stable economy with low inflation, low interest rates. New cars and new technology have helped revive this entire area. John Major has spoken of the economic renaissance of the East Midlands. Though some pockets of poverty and high unemployment remain, the transition from the traditional mining and textiles to the new manufacturing and technology industries has breathed new life into the area. But people are still worried about the health service, schools and the prospects for their children. Some of Toyota's employees take their children to this private nursery at nearby Repton. There's a shortage of nursery places in the area, and this one is popular and oversubscribed, despite prices that put it beyond the reach of many lower-paid workers. I mean, when Luke was um, first started, he was one and a half, and we could only get him into a nursery because this was a new nursery that was opening, all the others were full. Um, so people obviously like children to go to nursery, but there's only three or four in the area and they've only got a limited number of children they can take. I'm a teacher uh, 
um, a very uh, an independent school, I'm afraid to say. Um, but I'm afraid we need those sort of schools because the government is not providing, in my opinion, adequate state facilities. And that's why I'm afraid my daughter will probably follow that system. I don't really agree with it, the way the NHS is being treated as a business um, at the moment. I don't think it's working. This showroom in Loughborough supplies the cars with seats made by Mansfield's ex-miners to well-heeled voters in the key marginal seats of Middle England. Their priorities are tax and continuing prosperity, the sort of concerns the Tories so successfully exploited at the last election. Everyone says they're not putting taxes up, but you, you always uh, are concerned that perhaps that, that may come up once the election's over. Confidence is the most important thing. I mean, we deal in motor cars, uh, which is normally the second largest purchase after a house. So um, we find that you've got to, people have got to be confident, they've got to feel that they've got job security. And that, to me, is one of the most important things. It's a real sign of the end of the recession. Voters out buying new cars. Labour is engaged in an unprecedented drive to reassure them on tax and the economy whilst the Tories are out to convince them that Labour would jeopardise their prosperity. Carol Walker ending that report in Loughborough, a town 15 miles down the road from here, which has been the centre of the most extraordinary scrutiny in recent weeks by the pollsters and pundits, for the simple reason that Loughborough occupies a special place on the election swingometer. If a swing to Labour takes Loughborough, Tony Blair almost certainly takes Downing Street. They've been making bells in Loughborough for more than 150 years. Almost certainly somewhere near you, you regularly hear the sounds of Loughborough. But it's the political sounds coming out of this town that the politicians will be tuning into over the next four weeks. The reason? Loughborough has a political significance beyond its size. Anybody else want Bramley in that town? These are Middle Englanders. What they decide is almost certainly what the nation will decide. But are they aware of it? No, not really. I'm not very politically minded, actually. Does Labour win Loughborough? Oh, Tony Blair Tony Blair becomes Loughborough. Prime Minister? Yeah, cool. Oh, God. God help us. <laughs> I'm not sure I believe that. The politicians talk. But the politicians not only talk it, they know it. The Conservative chairman arrived today for lunch with leaders of the Asian community, a key group in the region. The seat was Labour until 1979, and its retention by the Conservative candidate, Ken Andrew, may not have been helped by the sitting member, the Health Secretary, Stephen Dorrell, moving to a new, safer seat next door. Dr Mawini disagrees. I'm very uh, enthusiastic about holding Loughborough. Uh, our candidates have already been adopted. Uh, they've done a lot of canvassing. Uh, the response is very encouraging indeed, and certainly much better on the doorstep than you would think from reading the opinion post. Labour's candidate is Andy Reid, today touring one of the world's top pharmaceutical companies, which employs 900 people on research. Labour's private political researchers find that things in Loughborough are closer than most polls suggest, but the party's technology spokesman was confident their lead wasn't at risk. There's no doubt that Labour have lost elections in the 1980s in places like Loughborough and indeed across the East Midlands. All my experience is that precisely the people who left Labour in the 1980s are now flooding back. Yeah, these in your window. Yeah. Loughborough is a two-horse race, but that doesn't deter the Liberal Democrat candidate, Diana Brass. They've no MPs in the region, but they're bigger in local government and they talk a good fight. As Paddy Ashdown said at our conference recently, um, in local government, we were a long way behind in 1992, uh, but we've come a long way since then, and uh, that's the way we do things in the Liberal Democrats. Loughborough's famous bell tower was today ringing out another unique recital, but it's the subtler political chimes here that no party can ignore. When the votes are counted in Loughborough, it will be a matter across the land of for whom the bell tolls. and nominations don't close until April the 16th. So far in Loughborough, there are a total of five candidates standing. From the East Midlands, the place where over the next four weeks there's everything still for the parties to play for, back to Michael Burke in London. Peter, thanks. And the main election news again tonight, 
Tony Blair has launched Labour's manifesto with a plea to the voters to trust him. He said he had no instant solutions and no magic wand, but said Labour's radical programme would make Britain better. Well, I'm joined now by our political editor, Robin Oakley. R Robin, Labour seem to be trying to pull off the difficult trick of saying absolutely nothing new and making a virtue of it. Oh, they're certainly rejoicing in the fact that there's nothing very new in this manifesto because the Tories are trying to attack them, saying that voting Labour would be a dangerous leap in the dark. So the more familiar that Labour's policies seem, uh, the more comfortable it is really for them. And, of course, Labour's manifesto has already been endorsed by the party at large. They had a referendum of most of Labour's party members, partly, of course, because... Labour governments in the past have tended to have trouble with their supporters claiming that they've sold them out on getting into government. So some cynics have, betrayed, have described this as uh, getting your betrayal in first. So that you can blame the whole party if it does go wrong. So how does this compare with the Tories who are coming up with some new policies this late in the day? Oh yes, the Tories have because as a government who've been in power for 18 years, the accusation against them is that they're running out of steam, that they haven't got new ideas. So they have produced new plans on pensions, on transferable tax allowances, on old folks care and so on. The danger of producing policies, though, at this stage is that they raise questions and worries in people's minds as well. It may show energy and steam, but it also has people worrying, saying, what's going to happen to my pension? What's going to happen to my old folks' home? Uh, how does the, uh, the organisation, the slickness, if you like, of the presentation of these two manifestos we've had so far, what, what does that tell us about the two parties? Well, we know that Labour is very good at the razzmatazz. We've seen it at their recent party conferences with Tony Blair presented as a kind of combination pop star, holy roller. And their presentation was very slick today. In all fairness, the Tory presentation of their manifesto was slick too. With what the parties spend uh, these days, uh, they should all be pretty good at presentation. But where Labour, I think, gained a trick was that they, had, they transferred to a new venue, a very big hall. They invited in all the foreign media too. It gave it a real sense of momentum, a sense of occasion, one of the biggest press conferences I've ever attended. I think uh, they certainly scored by doing that. And Tony Blair was there saying he, he, the Labour was the party of the radical centre. Did, did, it, did it feel radical or did it feel cautious? I think it felt more cautious, more safety first. Uh, the emphasis was certainly not on, on the radicalism. This is a, a Labour party which is about the business of reassurance. They want to uh, persuade the floating voters that they are a safe haven. Robert Oakley, thanks very much indeed. And that's the news tonight. Question Time with David Dimbleby is on at 10.45 here on BBC One. But from the 9 o'clock news, good night.